We're here today to talk about the things that trigger you. Before we get into that, just remember right now to click subscribe on our channel because we bring out new content every week and it's always thought provoking. This subject is kind of near and dear to our hearts because frankly, every divorcee and widow or widower we know has some trauma. Now trauma, we often think about like PTSD where a, a soldier is in battle and sees somebody close to them, you know, blown to bits and it's really a traumatic and horrible experience and they relive that and they have flashbacks and, and things like that. And we, we understand that is trauma. That is big T trauma. We want to talk a little bit about little T trauma also. That is from those little small things that may add up over time. For example, let's suppose you're married to someone for 20 years and every time you try to give her a kiss in the kitchen or coming home from work, she turns her head to avoid you. Well, once or twice you might think she's protecting her makeup, but when it occurs every time and it's constant, those little micro abuses or traumas add up to a big T. What happens as a result of that? We store that pain in our bodies and minds and we call that trauma. And then when something happens that reminds us of that, even subconsciously, emotions are triggered which are all out of all proportion to what's happening at the time. You know, Jeff, I actually think there can be some big T trauma in, in marriages when let's say, a revelation is made in a partnership that changes not only the current status quo, but everything you've ever known about the relationship. That can be very traumatic to find out something new that you did not know. You didn't even know you didn't know. Well, I have a friend who cheated on his wife for four years and he didn't tell her for 10 years. But then he told her and it destroyed their marriage. It obliterated it. And for him, it was over because he had the knowledge of it and she didn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, so I can think of definitely some big T and plenty of little T traumas. But the, the point is that those traumas then provide us with these opportunities to get triggered in life. And I think that the triggers we experience as single people are different than the triggers we'll experience once we get married again. So we talk all the time about healing, to be more healed. And I do th we do think that personal work is very, very important. As much as we can do to be aware of what our traumas are, be aware of what our triggers are, and then be able to talk back to it and to make it a more, a more logical response to, to the stressor or to the trigger than maybe we might be tempted to do emotionally, to take a time out for ourselves or whatever we need to do in the situation. I think actually triggers can help us heal. I think that when things come up, it's the opportunity to release it. It's the opportunity to let it go. And I think when we look at it that way, we can see it as a gift rather than an annoyance. You know, there's a, a story that I tell sometimes, and it's actually an intentional courtship, our book. I won't tell the whole thing here because it's, you can read the book for the details. But there was a, a time when I went to visit Kathy on a weekend when she had her kids, and I hadn't met them yet. But I, I went and visited her because I had something else going on in her city that the next day and she found out I was in town on Friday evening and said oh come over I met her kids for the first time that night and I helped put them to bed and we stayed up late talking and she said as I was leaving around 12 or 1 in the morning maybe we should cancel that breakfast we were planning tomorrow I don't want to be up late and then have to get up early on a weekend when I have my kids sounds reasonable right I was completely triggered by it. I thought it was rejection. You know, I must have overstayed my welcome and, and she was put off by it or she was sick of me or whatever. And of course, I get three quarters of the way to my brother's house where I was spending the night and it dawned on me, this is not rejection. I just spent five hours with her and met her kids for the first time, not rejection. You know what, when that thought came to me, I instantly felt peace. 
the reason why I felt that way, it's not because I'm bonkers or crazy, it's because I had experienced rejection in the past and I'm ultra sensitive to it. That's an example of a trauma being triggered. And we don't normally think about it because it's not bullets whizzing past us, but we personally know people who have been in war and had bullets whizzing past their heads who are petrified to pick up the phone and call a girl for a date. Even having experienced things like that doesn't immunize you from you know, the other kinds of things that you experience. You don't always have to respond to your triggers in the way you would emotionally do if you weren't aware of them. You wanted to call and break up with me. You wanted what? to reject me first. You wanted to do the damage before I could do any damage to you. And instead, you took a step back, you rethought the situation, you came to another conclusion, you felt peace, and all of a sudden, you're back in your right mind. We advise people not to make any serious decisions when they're being triggered, because it's always gonna feel like an urgent matter to take care of, and if you know you're emotionally flooded, if you know you're responding to something and doing so in, a, in more of a, an emotional way than, than really, it, it would constitute, it's likely not going to be in your best interest to do anything about it at that moment. Yeah, when you're triggered, it puts you into fight or flight mode. So the, the thing that Kathy was describing is, in that little example I used, I was in flight mode. I was, I've got to get out of here now. I've got to break up with her. I've got, you know, and was that all true? Was any of that true? No, that was my own trauma. I want to say something about this with regard to red flags. That's a very common term in the mid-singles world, at least the mid-singles world we were a part of. Oh, when this guy did this, that was a red flag. When this woman did this or that thing, that was a red flag. Well, a red flag is supposed to be something that warns you of danger, right? I'm going to tell you, Red flags, most of them aren't really warnings of things that are actually dangerous. They are triggers of our trauma. So how do you tell the difference? You tell the difference because you look at what actually happened and don't look at it as a sign that something worse might happen later. Take in it all by itself. How bad was it? If your date explodes at the waiter in a restaurant over a minor little thing, well, that might be a red flag. If your date screams at her mother or her children and uses profanity and get, you know, loses total control of herself, that might be a red flag. The fact that your date acts a little irritated isn't necessarily a red flag. Well, I think maybe the way to tell the difference is to ask yourself, do I have trauma around the subject? Am I being triggered? And if the answer is yes, then you have this golden opportunity to release it, to let it come up and work through it and let it go, rather than make a decision about the character of another person based on your own trauma. You know, Kathy, when, when I had that experience, I remember writing you a letter and telling you about it, and you wrote back to me. I thought the response was beautiful, but she wrote back to me saying, I'm, I understand and and have sympathy for where these anxious thoughts have taken you. And she said, we've both known divorce and it's easy to feel insecure in relationships when you've been divorced. That was exactly right. And that is why I had trauma over that. You know, Jeff, this actually reminds me of a time in our marriage where something you did triggered me. And I knew I was overly emotional about it. I could logically think that through, but I still, you know, started crying in the middle of the hall and you came up to me and you said, what are you afraid of? And you put your arms around me and I thought that was a beautiful response. And I, and you know, at the beginning of this video, we talked about how triggers are different when you're single versus when you're married. And as much work as you can do when you can be, when you're single, there's more work to do when you get married because then all of a sudden you're bumping against, up against someone in, you know, real life in a, in a shared space. 
and there's going to be opportunity to get triggered and that opportunity to then you know bring up the emotion and release it when you can be sensitive to your partner's triggers like I was in the letter and like you were in that moment then it, it makes it a lot easier to work through them. Right. I mean, I think I thought I was a lot more healed than I was when I was a mid-single because I didn't have my former wife around triggering me. And, you know, that's that's natural. It's normal. And then you get married and you've got somebody there stepping on your toes every day. And it's important to understand that's going to happen and to work through it. Kathy talked about taking a time out. You know, we put kids in timeout when they've lost control of themselves. Sometimes you got to put yourself in timeout. You can even tell your kids, you know, mommy or daddy needs to put themselves in timeout right now. And the kids will understand. They'll respect you for it. I think one really good illustration of why this is important. John and Julie Gottman, some of the foremost marriage researchers in the world, did this study where they they monitored the vital signs of people discussing difficult issues in their relationship. They discovered that whenever either person's heart rate reached above 100 beats per minute, there was a 0% chance that they were going to solve the problem they were discussing. In fact, it would intensify and get worse. Well, if you know that, if you have that information, then the next thing is to, to learn to be intentional. Because if you don't govern your relationship with intention, you'll govern it with emotion, and that's going to be a hot mess. So how do you govern it with intention? You have to become really self-aware. When you believe that you are flooded or your partner is flooded, call time out. Go to your separate corners. Don't have last words and parting shots and don't do things to keep the conversation going. Go do some self-soothing, get to a peaceful place. When Kathy and I have done this, we've generally found that we can resolve whatever it is in five or 10 minutes and rather than fighting all night. And we have the capacity to do that too. We, we could go there if, if we didn't have these other systems in place. And so just like you tell your kids to decide in advance what they're gonna do if they're offered drugs uh, or pornography or whatever else you don't want your kids involved in, you know, we tell them, don't wait till you're under peer pressure, till you're in the heat of the moment to decide. Decide in advance so that your response is automatic. Well, we're gonna give you the same advice as adults. Know what your response is gonna be when you're emotionally flooded in the heat of the moment. Because if you do that, then that process kicks in and you have a way of working through that which is less damaging. And you always want to come back to whatever it was you were discussing and finish the conversation, but do it when you're calm, when you're not triggered. Yes, and make decisions when you're not triggered. Exactly. Uh, you know, if you're single, you can put yourself in timeouts in all sorts of situations. You just excuse yourself, go use the restroom, say a little prayer. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do to, to give yourself that moment, that time that you need to compose yourself. And if you're in a relationship, you can have agreements about what you'll do when one of you is feeling emotionally flooded and know that you know your heart rate's likely getting that need to that hundred you know, beats per minute zone and you know, you might as well go and self-soothe rather than stick around and just do damage for hours. I mean, that, that's harder to recover from and impossible to resolve as we've discovered through study, uh, the, the Gottman study, so. There's also uh, an intermediate step that we use, that we've developed, that can also work if neither of you is losing it yet. And that is, if you find that you're starting to talk faster and interrupt and talk over each other, either person recognizing that this is happening can say, slow down. Or maybe even better, let's slow down. Like, so it's a partnership. Right, and our agreement is that when someone says, let's slow down, we stop, we take a deep breath, and we take turns talking. 
Now, if, if, you, if it hasn't gone too far already, that'll work to give you some space to calm down. If you're already too worked up, call timeout. And timeout is not a punishment for the other person. Let's be really clear about that. It's not accusatory. Hey, I can see that you're flooded. Time out. You know, it's not that. Time out is... Although that will be tempting if you're already flooded. <laughs> right. Time out is, is, is not a way to control the other person. It is merely taking a break to self-soothe for the sake of your relationship. Mid-singles, we've all had trauma. It's important to understand that and know that not every thought that comes into your head when you're worked up is rational. Uh, make sure you're in your peace, in your shalom, when you make important decisions. And if you're not in that, don't try to resolve relationship problems. Go to your corners, breathe, don't spend the time preparing your rebuttal, uh, and then come back together when you're ready to be calm, when you are calm. And I think you're going to solve things most of the time. Honestly, I think it's one of the best ways of divorce-proofing a marriage is to have these systems in place, these agreements, and these arrangements that you decide ahead of time how you're going to handle your triggers and any kind of trauma that comes up for you. Right. We believe intentional courtship which is the title of our book, leads to intentional marriage. And if you govern your marriage with intention instead of emotion, you have a good chance to beat the odds. And remember, any time is a great time for more love in your life. We would love to hear your comments about your own trauma and or triggers and how you've managed to handle them in the comments. Thanks so much for watching.